well, hopefully we'll make it to 15 minutes with trigger fingers, but surprisingly, there's a lot of stuff out there that we can discuss, so let's get started. So I don't have any disclosures and we'll go over the preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative, but I think it's always good to just review background really quickly. And we know that the prevalence is about 2.6 in the general population. Um, I'm not gonna touch a lot on pediatric trigger finger, but we'll touch on more adult trigger finger today, knowing that ring and thumb are the most common. We see it in women more than men and adults. And it's actually the fourth leading cause of referrals to hand therapists. And we know that open release has uh, a very high success rate. So just as a review of the anatomy, I think everyone knows what the pulleys are, but um, they're really made up of two components. So the membranous component and then the ret retinacular component, which actually is the pulley itself. So that's a much thicker part where the membranous portion uh, is much thinner. The A1, it's always key to note, is about nine millimeters in length, where A2 is about twice that size at 17 millimeters. And that's always something good to keep in mind when you're doing an open or even a percutaneous release. Um, and uh, almost 100% of the time, but quoted at 95% in the literature, is the separation between A1 and A2, but that separation is actually quite small. So it's between 0.4 and 4.1 millimeters. Um, and then as we all know, when you do a trigger thumb, which is a little bit different, usually involves a different incision, but keep in mind that the radial digital nerve to the thumb is right under the skin, 2.19 millimeters deep. Um, and so you have to be aware of that as you're doing the open release. So in terms of pathophysiology, it's that mismatch between the size of the flexor tendon and the contents inside of it, uh, between the pulley and the contents. Um, as a gliding, as a tendon glides through a stenotic sheath, it causes that catching. Um, and then with power, power grip, you get an increased loads, which is an oblique increased load at the distal edge of the pulley. So that chronic friction causes that intratendinous nodule that you can often palpate or see on a patient when you act them ask them to accidentally flex and you'll see the triggering. And then histology always shows that fibrocarnalis meta metaplasia. So on exam, it's typically pain. Um, and as my mentor, Dr. Boyer always said, it's always a trigger finger. When you don't know what the diagnosis is, it's usually a trigger finger. Um, now, most of the time it's palmar right over the MCP joint, but you may see pain that is uh, dorsal over the PIP joint. Some patients will even say that the pain extends up into the forearm. They may have a swollen finger or swelling over the palm, and then you'll see that clicking or locking. And if you catch it in the early phases, they might not have either, but only pain. And then you may or may not be able to palpate that nodule at the palm or crease. So the grading system in grade zero is normal. So typically we don't see this, but you do see grade one and you rarely see the grade four. So I usually talk about it in terms of pre-triggering, triggering, and then a locked trigger finger when I discuss it with my patients. And most of the time we're seeing grade two or three in our clinics. So I think one of the you know, preoperative considerations that we've already talked about a little bit here is what to do with a diabetic patient. We know that the prevalence of trigger finger is actually quite high in diabetic patients. So um, it's up at least twice in some literature, you see a 20% in the diabetic population versus 2.6 in general. Um, it's usually multiple fingers and bilateral hands. Um, ring finger is the most common um, and it's related to duration of the disease. And so I think it's important to know the effects of hyperglycemia on collagen uh, metabolism. And so basically what happens is they believe that collagen um, is actually doesn't get degraded at the same rate uh, when you have a hyper, hyperglycemia. And so that's what's causing the collagen is still sitting around and causing, um, causing the complications. So what about A1C? Like we just talked about, is it a risk factor? Well, it depends on what uh, article you read. So you can read one article that says yes, you can read a few articles that say no. What the studies do show is that the duration of the disease is actually way more important than the control. So um, typically you can talk to a patient about how long they've had the disease and then what associated symptoms they have. So if they have associated diabetic nephropathy, um, and that's um, shown to be more important than actually the A1C levels. So non-operative management, I think we all know this, activity modification, uh, anti-inflammatories and splinting. So um, one study looked at the types of splint to use and the MCP splint that you can see here in this picture, uh, which holds MCP in either neutral or 10 degrees of flexion. Success rate, if you wear this 
full time for a total of six weeks. Actually, the success at resolving the trigger finger was in the 70%. So that's actually quite successful. And then you can talk about injections. So in non-diabetic rates, the success rate is quoted at about 60, 60% after one single injection versus diabetics. Um, it's 50 to 57% for non-insulin dependent versus much lower in an insulin dependent diabetic. And then again, the injections are less efficacious if, it's, if they have any associated diabetic nerve neuropathy or nephropathy. Um, we do know from several studies that there is that transient hyperglycemia and it's something to make your patients aware of that they should be a little bit more vigilant if they're doing uh, finger sticks on, for up to five days after surgery. And that additionally, that a repeat injection, the success rate goes way down. Uh, one study quotes it at about 39%. So what about the use of ultrasound? Um, I think there's a lot of literature out this day using ultrasound, not only for injections, but for trigger finger release, carpal tunnel injections, all of the above. Um, ultrasound is great for showing thickening of the tendon and the pulley and for diagnosing trigger finger. If there's any question of it, you can actually do active and dynamic ultrasound to show bunching. Um, typically the, the numbers that they're quoting in the literature for normal pulley, it's less than 0.5 millimeters. But when you think about an abnormal pulley, it's greater than one. Um, however, the studies, you know, if you look at an injection and one study showed that an injection that there's 15% accuracy, if you just do it blindly and 70% ultrasound, uh, the accuracy is so accuracy is much higher, but then when they looked at it, it doesn't really matter. So it doesn't really matter if you're in the tendon sheath with regard to pain or decreased need for reinjection. So, um, that sort of does not support the need for use of ultrasound in trigger finger injections. But what about the PIP contracture? Um, I think that this is an issue that uh, needs to be addressed preoperatively. Um, the thought behind the PIP is that chronic inflammation of the tendon leads to uh, enlargement, um, and then the FDS becomes shortened and causes a PIP contracture. What I mentioned before is really important to document this preoperatively and discuss the outcome, because all the studies show that um, if you have a preoperative PIP contracture, it requires longer time for symptom relief. Um, and it's a predictor of prolonged, prolonged post-operative symptoms. Um, and they also tend to have less success with steroid injection. So I think it's also important to remember that, you know, we need to talk about the differential diagnosis in the snapping finger because not all clicking is a, is a trigger finger. Um, the most, most of the time, the other options that you see are sagittal band rupture, which some people can get confused with a trigger finger. Um, where you have subluxation of the extensor tendon. You can have a snapping lateral band, which is volar subluxation. Um, you, in, you can have an accessory collateral osteophyte, which is typically, and you can see this in the x-ray here, it's on the radial side, most commonly in the index finger. And then in the middle finger, you can see these osteophytes associated with arthritis and you have snapping of the accessory collateral. And here in this uh, image here, you can see a, um, a snapping lateral band in the image. So I think that's probably where the bulk of the talk is, but we can talk about some intraoperative considerations. So as previously mentioned, the benefit of Wallent. So it's high quality care. Um, you know, I think one of the best ways to get it through your institution is obviously to do a cost benefit analysis. And this is actually a great talk that was given out of Stanford. Um, by Dr. Kamal. And so you can see here that what doesn't change, the preoperative time doesn't really change. Um, the surgery time, sorry, the preoperative time does change. The surgery time doesn't really change, but the rest of the time there is what's statistically significant, right? So you can see that there's less setup time when you use Wallent, there is less time in the OR, less PACU time. And this was done for individual surgeon just to show pre and post implementation. Um, obviously, um, you can show patient satisfaction, um, and then you can show that it lowers cost, as was shown for carpal tunnel. So incision, there's not much that tips about incision. I think you can do it oblique, you can do it longitudinally, you can do it in the crease. What we know is that it doesn't really matter, but getting the right incision so that you are over the start of the pulley or right over the mid-substance of the pulley for releasing it. Um, Studies show that if you measure the distance between the PIP crease and the proximal digital crease and take that distance and then go proximally, that, that um, shows you the start of the A1 pulley. So I typically will use that with my residents so that they are aware uh, where to start their incision or where to center their incision here. 
Um, one of the other things when I release um, trigger finger, especially if you had somebody that had a, a long lasting trigger finger has gone, undergone multiple uh, injections, it's often difficult to actually see where the end of the A1 pulley is. Um, less so difficult if you actually lift up the flap and look on the inside. You can usually see that delineation between the A1 and A2 pulley quite well when you look on the inside of the flap, as you can see in this picture down here. Just elevating it and looking on the inside will give you a better sense of where to release and if you need to, if you've already gone far enough or if you need to release even more of A2. <clears throat> so what happens when you finish a trigger finger under Wallens and you still have a persistent triggering? So the options are to consider um, releasing A3, which is where you have some distal FDP bunching. Um, and you can usually feel triggering when it's distal after you've released A1. So you can excise over PIP or slightly just proximally depending on what type of incision you wanna make and then you just release A3. And then the question is, when do you move on and take the ulnar slip? And typically the you know, literature say, tells you that you should take it in rheumatoid patients you should take it in the ped pediatric trigger finger that isn't the trigger thumb um, or in a patient that has persistent triggering despite other interventions. And so here you can see uh, in this article, it's, you know, it's a standard incision. If you're actually planning on taking the ulnar slip, you make an extended incision after you've, you've released A1. Um, it's a proximal release of A1 right at the level of A3, and then you take out the ulnar slip. Now, if you look at pediatric trigger fingers, the literature that originally talked about releasing it, and the literature does say that they take the ulnar slip, um, they arbitrarily take the ulnar slip and pediatric trigger finger um, and took the other slip if, uh, the, if the radial slip had, had happened to have damage to it. But really more so in rheumatoid, we take the ulnar slip. And then finally in post-operative considerations, you know, the success rate for carpal tunnel. So the success rate in open um, as it coded, it's somewhere between 90 to hundred percent success rate for non-diabetics. Um, and then in uh, diabetics, it, it's about 77%. Now I don't talk a lot about percutaneous here. It's not a technique that I use, but if you look at the two year follow-up, the recurrence for diabetics is about 25% versus 14%. Uh, in the general population. That's one study that was done um, by Huang. And then if you look, there was another, another study that only did one year follow-up, sorry about that, and showed no recurrence. So basically, if you look at midterm follow-up, um, there's slightly uh, higher recurrence rate, but no difference at one year. Uh, and then finally, complications. Um, most of the complications are minor. They're typically scar pain and tenderness. Um, you can have some superficial cellulitis, but the major ones I think are worth noting. So infection, you can have flexor tenus and avitis, and I think it requires to have really good vigilance in watching your patients um, and listening to their concerns. Persistent flexion contracture, triggering nerve injury, synovial fistula, and bow stringing. So post-operative flexion contracture, most commonly see it in the middle finger. Um, but most of these are managed non-operatively and it's worth having that conversation with the patient. And it's really important to note whether they have this preoperatively as we talked about before. So an early OT refer referral for a dynamic or a static splint is great for a flexion contracture. Um, and then uh, finally operative, um, you can take a patient back. So oftentimes um, after uh, just a basic release. If they have persistent uh, PIP contracture, you can always take them back and do a uh, slip excision of the FDS or a check grain ligament release, but the um, results of that are relatively unpredictable. All right, so the persistent trigger finger. Um, in these patients, I typically consider re-injection um, after surgery if they have it up their first week, uh, when I see them back at their first six week visit. Um, I do recommend OT and tell them that this typically resolves that the inflammation gets better. Uh, and then again, you always have the backup of an FDS slip excision, but I rarely have to do this. And then, you know, infection. And I think this is the, the dreaded uh, thing that we worry about in uh, trigger finger surgery, because we do, you know, it's a very simple surgery with a very low complication rate, but this is an early um, FTS after a trigger finger release in a patient. It just requires uh, identifying it early for superficial infections and then taking the OR quickly to prevent any um, worsening or at the earliest signs of FTS. And bow stringing, we know it's usually an A2 compromise. So what happens in bow stringing is that the pulley is further away from 
uh, the bone and an inc the increased distance from the tendon to the joint axis causes an increased moment arm. So it also increases the work of flexion. Um, and so typically in the setting of bow stringing, you have to talk about reconstructing the pulley. Um, there's a study that was done that was looking at factors that cause prolonged post-operative symptoms, which I had mentioned before. It looked at about a hundred patients that either had single or multiple, and these are greater than eight weeks worth of symptoms. And so they looked at a, a whole slew of symptoms. But what they showed is that um, the risk factors for prolonged post-operative symptoms are duration of preoperative symptoms, preoperative PIP contractures, and then finally fraying of the tendon. So these are always things that you should document in the operative note, um, and then also document in your preoperative evaluation. So just to wrap up what I think are the most common pearls and pitfalls, you know, I think that, and what I spent most of the time talking about today is pre-op, because I do think that most of the discussion comes in pre-op and assessing the patient. Make sure you know how long it's been, uh, make sure you know if they have a contracture and make sure it's the right diagnosis, because sometimes you get fooled. Um, if there's any question, consider dynamic ultrasound. This is the time when I actually consider ultrasound if I'm not sure that it's a classic trigger finger. Um, and then I discuss the risk of prolonged recovery in certain patients. And I think it's important to tell them, you know, most of the time you can say you're going to be fine, you know, by two to four weeks, you'll have a thick scar for a little bit of time. But I think it's important to know who's going to take eight weeks or longer to get better. And then I think in the diabetic patient, it's really important to talk to them about the success rate of the surgery, to also note the severity of the disease. And especially in those patients who you already know have a lower success rate is to talk to them about, you know, if they have a PIP contracture. Um, here's a list of my references and I am ready for questions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schroeder. Uh, Dr. Harness, you had a question for Dr. Schroeder. Um, yes, let's see. So um, first one was how long do you wait after a steroid injection has failed before you will operate? Um, some recent data has shown that uh, waiting about three months should be uh, kind of where you're looking at doing a surgery before you'll have decreased risk of an infection. And then the other question was, um, do you have a maximum number of fingers that you will operate on in one uh, surgical date? Um, will operating on multiple fingers you know, result in uh, stiffness postoperatively? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I agree with you. I usually tell people three months um, just for the risk of increased infection. I think the interesting part of the literature that just came out, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's actually a steroid injection anywhere. Um, so it's also, you know, important to talk to patients that they've had steroid injections elsewhere before surgery and advise them of that. Um, so I do try and tell them to wait three months. I think in the setting of a locked trigger finger that's had an injection, I would go to surgery sooner. Usually I try and wait six weeks for that, but I haven't had one of those in a long time. Um, how long are you waiting? I definitely say three months, but even with that rule, I recently had an infection. So it was just over three months. So I, I think it's real. Um, so I, I wait at least three, but even then I'd say that, you know, there's still a little bit of a risk. You're so close to having a, an injection performed. Yeah. I, you know, the hard part is when you have a patient that comes in with a trigger finger that they're scheduled for on one hand and they want an injection on the other hand at the same time. Right. You know, so you have to have, I have that conversation with them and I say, well, it's a really low infectious risk, but it does double your risk. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most of them still want it. Um, but I, you know, I do have to make sure that they understand that. I and I have a couple of quick questions it. for uh, you just on technique. One is you mentioned in your talk doing a longitudinal incision, which I hate. I don't like that. I think the transverse one is better because you can hide it in the flexion crease and you have less adhesions longitudinally over the tendon potentially, but maybe you, you could amplify that. And and the number of injections you'll do before you do any surgery, because you talked about the timing. Hate's a pretty strong word, Dr. Slater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I'll tell you, I trained with the transverse incision. I trained in hiding it in the crease. And then you started seeing more and more patients that came in that had the longitudinal incision and I couldn't even see where their incision was. So I do think that, you know, as the scar matures, you don't see it. Um, I think it gives a little bit better leeway 
um, in terms of being able to manipulate the wound uh, north or south as you need to go. Um, so that's kind of why I've transitioned from the oblique or transverse incision. Now, just to kind of address the earlier question is how many trigger fingers do I inject? I think in the multiple trigger finger, when I'm thinking about like three at once, I will do a transverse incision in the crease in that situation. Um, but um, I think to address the second part of your question was uh, how many injections do I give? And that's like the million dollar question, right? I think it's a, I feel like I'm counseling all my medical students about how many like a ways to apply to <laughs> and all those questions, because, um, you know, I think it's really person dependent, right? You might have the patient that comes back once a year that does great. And I will inject somebody once a year for 20 years, right? Um, but if it, what I tell them is I will do three a year and that's it. And then you go to surgery. Do you have a different protocol? I personally just do one injection. If it didn't work, I'm not going to waste time doing another one. That shortens their disability time. I just take them to surgery and fix it with a short operation. So that's my bias. I wanted to make a comment about incision. So the compromise is an oblique one. And I try really hard to find an oblique natural crease because then you get the best of everything, but personal preference. One thing you pointed out about the PIP stiffness, and I've become a lot more alert to that over the years, because a lot of times we don't know or we're not thinking about how stiff they are, nor is the patient because they've been stuck for so long. And that becomes the problem that bothers them the most after the triggering is gone. So it sounds like you extra counsel your patients ahead of time uh, to that PIP contracture, or have you learned the hard way like me? <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's more retrospective counseling. Like we talked about this in pre-op. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> 